Welcome back to another episode of Gardening with Ryan. In this one, I'm going to talk about theology, specifically radical Lutheranism. Now, what is radical Lutheranism? I am not really the person to ask that question to, as I am pretty new to the terminology and literature. But... I just read Gerhard for, uh, Ferdy's for, uh, I think it was his first book, but I read his book, Where God Meets Man, and this video will by no means be a complete review of the book or anything of the sort, but I just wanted to uh, give some thoughts on it. First, check out this jade that I planted. See, it actually was standing up and looked really nice, but it was really... Well... It was dry for easier moving out of the pot, and that caused it to kind of collapse. But we're going to bring it back. And it's going to stand up like normal again. I hope. But... Anyway, to get into it a bit, Ferdy, and my memory is not perfect, but he opens the book by talking immediately and readily. And okay, first of all, I want to say, what I will say is I think that you should read this book. I think you will find it incredibly intellectually stimulating. And Ferdy was obviously a very smart man, even if you disagree with him. So I recommend giving it a read. But getting into it, he goes straight to the issue of predestination and how men seek to find themselves accepted in God's eyes. And these are uncomfortable terms that make us all squeam I don't know if all of us, but makes us scrupulosity type folk squeamish. But instead of dancing around the issue, he cuts right to it. And then, he does what most, un uh, most authors either don't do or are unwilling to do. He goes and directly cuts at the heart of where most people's assurance issues lie. What do I mean by that? He explains... the theology that leads to doubting assurance without dressing it up in confusing words, in a sense. And he makes some assertions like, well, I mean, he, he talks about the theology of the latter, the whole, um, I need to climb this ladder to heaven either by believing the right doctrine by the right way, like bending my mind a certain way, or obeying a certain set of commands. And one thing to keep in mind is that the point of the book is to talk about Luther's down-to-earth God. And then what Ferdy gets into, to be brief and obviously not complete, is... God's down-to-earth revealed nature. That God's will for humanity is revealed in Christ dying for the world and in the sacraments. So an assertion that there's only one God and that you cannot seek God in his hiddenness 
So look to where he has spoken in your baptism and in the word with your baptism for assurance. And then, and, and I actually thought that that was fantastic because I mean, we need, I mean, he, he touched on the Pelagian controversy and he emphasized how the church has always confessed that man cannot choose to believe except by grace. And he's like, it seems that many churches have forgotten like our ancient proclamations here, but this is still true. Now, I like that a lot because we so often search ourselves and try to make faith something we can conjure. And I thought that was really good. Then, he gets a bit into an area where I would say I don't have as much agreement. Some other people would say I simply don't understand what he's saying yet, but I would agree. I don't know. But when he starts talking about St. Anselm and gets into his work, Why God Became Man, he talks about the satisfaction theory of atonement put forth in it. It's commonly called the satisfaction theory when we divide up atonement categories today. And he comes down on it hard. In, and his main assertion is that it's a form of ladder theology, even if salvation is by grace alone. Because he would say in that world, then God needs to be paid a debt to forgive sins. Or, I'm not quoting him perfectly here, but he basically said you need a God that needs to loophole himself and make a transaction within the Godhead before he can act externally, and that's not a very almighty God. And, you know, that did get my head spinning quite a bit on atonement theories and the language we use, but he went on to say that it's actually improper to use the language of Christ suffering the wrath and condemnation of the Father for our sins on the cross, the usual Protestant penal substitution language. And, see, I've had a discussion with a radical Lutheran friend of mine to try to discuss through this, and he's saying that Ferdy doesn't, in essence, disagree with what I'm saying. I think with the atonement theories, and ways we understand the atonement, we have to understand that they are definitionally analogical, right? Like, it's not like with penal substitution, there's actually like a courtroom, like floating somewhere up in the sky called heaven, where when justification happens, there's like this giant cosmic hammer that gets slammed down. Right? And I think it's the same with atonement metaphors, in that... And some and people might be like, oh, that's liberal, what I'm about to say. Well, it might be, but like, that's not the point. Um, it's just kind of what seems like observable fact. It seems that different cultures have different ways of speaking about the atonement because as Ferdy rightly points out, I think, to the one who knows condemnation from the law, and I think he gets it exactly right that even the rustling of the wind can terrify the conscience. To The person who is struck by the law, what I think we see in these different atonement theories is people being delivered from what 
they see as their greatest condemnation or how they understand what they need to escape or how they understand their own doomed state or just just how that culture sees their everyone knows they have a sin problem okay like everyone knows that the earth is screwed up and bad things happen people just have different explanations for why there is evil in the world and such but no one's debating the existence of evil and bad things really except maybe like Taoists and stuff but that's not important right now so in the east they tend to use less of even less of a lot of the Israeli language of substitution which comes closer to penal substitution than I think we find in the Old Testament and I think that's what I think that's actually okay because I think in the east they tend to um, not have as much of a judicial system in general I mean this has been observed for a really long time that uh, European culture and such and western world in general is kind of seen as law based or or uh, like formal ordinance and transgression based whereas uh the east has been seen as i don't want to say intuition based because that almost seems like i'm saying there's like some subjective what do i think is right but i should say more of a view that People need healing, more of the emphasis on the physician part, more of the emphasis in the uh, Christ's literal physical salvation from death. And I appreciate a lot of what the author says. Now, that might offend a lot of my traditional Protestant friends, but hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. Some people disagree with me on this, but I think that the impassibility of God is biblical. Do you? If you're one of the conservative people that got mad at what I just said, you probably do. <laughs> but, um, anyway... If God is impassible... And if God's actions, even though we experience them in time, are outside of time. God being outside of time. And if we affirm that all of God's actions are eternal, even if the effects are not eternal. For example, I am not eternal, but God's act of creating the world is eternal. Yeah, I know some people who are not as inclined to classical theism would disagree with me today. That's fine. I'm not going to throw you in the fire just because you disagree with me. But, um... No, I got way off track. That's okay. That's what this show's about. But... I think what Ferdy puts a really good emphasis on that we miss today is that the resurrection in a lot of our churches is largely a side note. Like, okay, the transaction happened on the cross and, like, the resurrection happened next or whatever, and we'll talk about it on Easter. I mean, we gather on the Lord's Day for a reason, and I think we need to understand more and get it into our heads more. And as Ferdy does when he talks about in his atonement theory, is that Christ died a real death. See, I think a lot of atonement theories de-emphasize the death of Christ and people are like, no, I don't, but like 
the emphasis is some transaction taking place upon the cross and so I'm not saying this language has no place so there's no truth to it I'm just saying the fact that he actually died really needs to sink into people because the human problem is hey we're all gonna die but we have a God that says, I died, I'm alive, I've got the keys to hell and death. Eat, drink, and live, you know? So, while I'm not denying that the penal model has its place, and I think Ferdy is going a bit too far in saying that, um... I mean, we blaspheme God if we use it and stuff. Like, I, I, I think that's a bit too far. But I understand, in a sense, what he's getting at, in the sense that by trying to add worth to the death of Christ, we can kind of minimize the death of Christ, because we use death of Christ to refer to some huge underlying theology, rather than death of Christ, meaning death of Christ. Like, I didn't really even think about this much until I read the book. But just let the words hit you, death of Christ, and don't add any theological import to it. Right? Like, the God of the universe died. That should hit you a certain way. But he became man to die and rise again to defeat humans. That's the God who has promised to keep you. Now, then... Now, okay, let me clarify. This is not a full review. This is not me claiming to represent Ferdy perfectly. These are just my thoughts. But... Uh, he, he also then brings up an issue that I think he inadequately deals with when he talks about the issue of the fact that, um... You know... Well, what about people who die in a state of damnation? Uh, we constantly need conversion every day and fall from the faith all the time, right? Like, like we constantly need to be converted. And he brings up and phrases it a certain way. And if any of you know the answers to these questions, I'd love to hear them in the comments. But um, he brings up... A really valid, I think, point where he says, okay, well, even with all this said, grace and faith being created by the sacraments, you run into the issue of, <laughs> what if I die when I'm on the bad side, man? And... He mainly answers it by just saying we don't have a God who works that way. And then he... And then let me clarify. Let me clarify. He, he does say that much more can be written on this. And that it will. But he included it in the book for a reason. And I think if he was going to include it, he should have gone a little farther. Other than just saying God doesn't work like that. Like, even just a citation or brief thoughts, I don't know. Perhaps I'm misremembering. Or maybe he considered it more fleshed out later in the book, but, um... This is just a very minor criticism, because overall I really like the book. And now we get to where I disagreed quite a bit. But... I might... I, I mean, I'm not... I'm still churning on a lot of this stuff, but a lot of it just hit me as, hmm, that doesn't sound right. Well, the first one that I'll bring up, this is, I've never been very popular for this opinion. Or I should say this opinion has never been one of my popular ones, where I don't believe in like a secular state or that it's even possible to sustain one. But, and I'm not like an Americanist, pluralist kind of thing. Where he really goes on that like the essential implications of this theology are like, 
that no religion or even Christianity of any sort can be allowed to creep into government, and he expands on two kingdoms theology that way. I, I disagree there, but I disagree with most American Christians on that, so that's fine. And then, on the eternal law. I think I take, I mean, I don't know. I'm no professional, but if I have to gauge where I'm at, I'm at somewhere of a mediating position between those who would agree with him and those who come down on him for it. Now, I think there are a few points to be made. Or I'll just tell you where I stand, honestly. Because he, he basically asserts that there's no eternal law. And that... Well, he, he, he asserts that Christ did not climb any ladder for us that we can't climb. There's no ladder that can be climbed to satisfy God in the sense of the law. And then he would say that no law is eternal and laws are only given and always dependent on circumstances. Now this is where I would kind of disagree in the sense of I think that God's law is eternal, and I think that it must be revealed in a culturally relevant way. Now, what do I mean by that? An example that's been used to me to point out that the law is imperfect by radical Lutherans, and I haven't seen Ferdy assert that, so I'm not going to attribute that to him, but the law is imperfect, which I'm okay with saying if we mean if we mean incomplete, since it's a partial revelation, but if we mean flawed, that's where I have issues, but um, one example that's been given to me of the law being flawed is the Bill of Divorce Law, given for hardness of heart. Now, I would say in that situation that there's obviously no law about a bill of divorcement where there's no divorce, right? But I think it's an et a revelation of God's eternal character to care for women. And if you, if you want more info behind that, go look up what the bill of divorce is actually for. It was to guarantee the safety of the woman and that she would be cared for. But I won't get into that here. But anyway, um, so what I would say is what Jesus meant there is because of the hardness of your hearts, there was a partial revelation rather than a full revelation of God's holiness. Because of the hardness of their hearts. But not that, that revelation was flawed, because nowhere in there was there a command to be divorced. There was no command to sin. It was, if this happens. So I think what we can see there is that, objectively and immutably, from what we see is Jesus drawing on this commandment, Taking care of women is important, and marriage is sacred. Or when um, St. Paul names sins in his epistles, that those who do such things shall not be saved. Um, when he's talking about all of us. I think that he is naming things that are objectively against the natural order. And that as long as God is God, such a thing would be in opposition to God. Now, I don't think that the letter of the law is eternal in the sense of most of the laws 
of the Bible or the commandments would make no sense in a world where everyone's immortal. <laughs> right? <laughs> Like, does anyone think anyone's going to be sinning in heaven? So, I think there's room for legitimate discussion about this. And I've seen people on the internet throwing anathema hammers over these issues. And I really think that's a bit overboard. Come on, guys. I just learned that Ferdy is on the official LCMS reading list put out by Harrison. Like, if you if you have that big of an issue, go take it up with your, like, synod, synod president and not the dude online. Right? <laughs> but... So... I would say that Jesus, I mean, Ferdy speaks more of Jesus abolishing the law than fulfilling it, in a sense. And that is kind of where I didn't like the language so much, because Jesus kind of said, thanks not that I'm come to abolish law, but to fulfill it. So, while I would lean towards myself the more oh and I also would lean towards the more I don't know he hasn't touched on it much yet but the third use of the law I would lean towards a slightly more traditional view I guess or I don't know that which is outlined in the book of Concord maybe or I believe that it, I mean, I, but I also believe that the law always condemns, but that Christians should use it as a guide for serving their neighbor. But, like, they're going to fail, and that's kind of the point, to drive them to a savior. So, as you can see, you might have all sorts of thoughts of where I am theologically. And feel free to leave them in the comments. I'm not too strongly opinionated about these things. These are just my thoughts. But I think these are legitimate discussions that can be had without anathematizing each other. And... Like, you, you know, I, I heard, it, like, just like, oh, if you just read any of Ferdy's books, you'll see him just, like, deny the atonement, man. And I can see how that would happen if you don't finish the book, but, like, he just goes into, like, Adam has no remedy. He has to die, and this can only happen if Christ dies and then raises to defeat death. And I'm like, how is that denying the cross, man? Now, I'm not going to say who, but you might rec rem remember the quote, a very famous... Yeah, I'll just say who, because this was put out publicly. Um, Reverend Fisk. I, I love the guy. I, I love Worldview Everlasting. Or, loved. I, I don't watch him that much anymore, but when, uh, that was like... That, that was my stuff for a long time. But he made an assertion pretty boldly. The cross does not save you. Or, or, or no, no, he did not say that. He said the resurrection does not save you. It's the cross where it happened. And I was like, whoa! Because that wasn't just like not emphasize. That wasn't just a lack of emphasis on the resurrection. Like a problem that like it kind of made me squirm. So. Oh, on God being impassable. If God is impassable, there is a sense in which
you already are seated in the heavenlies. And if God is indeed impassable, he cannot in time go from not angry to angry at the sun because of imputed sins. Of course, God's wrath can fall on people at different times, but God the Father cannot change in mood by nature. The Father is not incarnate. So, oh, check out how much health this cactus was like basically dead when we first came to it. But, I guess if there's one thing I want people to take from this, it's we can have this as a legitimate discussion without throwing anathemas, I think. Or if you think anathemas need to be thrown, stop just writing book reviews about it and arguing about it on the internet about it and take it up with your district president and SISM or something, you know? Like, go join Eldona or something. I don't know. But the people that are in the LCMS just saying, like, oh, they're denying the gospel, and, like, their district president is putting the dude on the reading list. Oh. I mean... I can get behind that and understand where they're coming from if they're one of the people that's like, yeah, my synod president's a total piece of trash. <laughs> but, like, if they claim to like the guy and support the ministry, and, and I'm saying on the other way around, too, I think a lot of times... I mean, it's really easy to fall into an insular camp, and usually once you get into a camp you get into more of the debates within that camp rather than that camp versus the broader camps, for example. You get in a denomination, and at first it's that denomination versus the others, then there's like the subsets of that denomination, and the different schools of thought within that, and then those subsets. And the more you get into an echo chamber of people that mostly agree with you, the more the other side's language starts to not make sense. But I think... One thing that I would say to the radical Lutheran side is keep in mind that, like, a lot of the stuff that I would agree is a bit silly really is, like, in Chemnitz and in the Book of Concord and stuff. So, I don't know if you can say it's not Lutheran. Now, does that matter? That That's, like, a totally different discussion for a different episode of gardening, but I hope you found this stimulating, and I I know which radical Lutheran I I, I know which radical Lutheran is going to watch this first. Please leave a comment explaining these things if you want. And if you don't, one of the other radical Lutherans will beat you to it, I guess. Well, thanks for watching this episode of Gardening with me. I'm Ryan. It's Sunday. And... I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to church tonight. I think there's an evening mass. Let me see if we can reach from here. Let's see. Yes, yeah, see way, see the blue with the cross? I might go to evening or... See, the, the stopping of evening services like killed me. It's like, I was an evening service onlyist. 1611 for a really long time. Anyway. Thanks for watching.